Um, we really appreciate y'all all being here today. Um, this is really exciting for our first uh, virtual stakeholder meeting and I really wish we could all be here in person, um, but it's definitely really exciting to see so many people interested in um, open space. So um, my name is Jennifer Dyke and I'm the team lead for the city's open space conservation program and I'm also the stormwater program manager. Uh, with the Transportation and Public Works Department. And so I have several um, of our team members here today and I wanted to highlight who you can actually see on camera today. Um, and so let me just take a minute and do that. I'm just gonna go across the screen so I don't miss anybody. So I guess when I say your name, like raise your hand or something like that. So, so just going across my screen, I've got Robert Kent, the uh, TPL Texas Director. I've got Brandy Kelp, the City of Fort Worth Environmental, Matt Moffa, TPL, Michelle Villafranca, City of Fort Worth Parks, Edith Marvin, and she's one of our partners at the Council of Government, Eric Flatiger, our planning manager in our new um, planning and data analytics department, the mouthful, <clears throat> Kate Linzer, and she is with TPL as well. Let's see, Taj Shotland. I don't know how to say your last name. I wish I would have asked before. <laughs> and then we've got Stacy Pierce with uh, Streams and Valleys, one of our partners. I can't see your face today, Stacy. And I think that's all. Am I missing any, any other panelists? <clears throat> Looks like I got everybody. <clears throat> okay, awesome. So we've got uh, other City of Fort Worth team members, I think, that are attendees as well. We've got a, a great interdepartmental team. So just some housekeeping before I get started. I know some of y'all have already heard this, uh, but everybody is on chat. And so we want to make sure um, that if you have questions or comments, please use the Zoom functions, raise your hand, use the chat icon or the Q&A icon. Um, and there's also a um, comment card link under the chat where you can send us your comments after the meeting uh, multiple times if you forget a comment, as Brandy said earlier. So, um, and then we'll remind you of those as we go into, at the end of this meeting, there'll be a discussion time when we can actually open the floor more and have some discussion um, and, and hear people's voices. So thank you again for coming. So let's just go ahead and jump in. Next slide, Robert. Okay, so going through the agenda, I was just gonna kick us off and give us a little bit of background about the Open Space Conservation Program, why we started it, and uh, why it's important for the city. And then I'll, I'll hand this off to Robert and Trust for Public Land's gonna talk a little bit about their role and scope, our modeling goals, the survey that we're gonna really want your help with, um, trying to get people to take it. Brandy will then talk about uh, the potential to have some small group meetings, virtual meetings, uh, and then we'll have some wrap up and discussion at the end of that meeting, at the end of this meeting. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so the Open Space Conservation Program purpose, I'm going to read it just because I, I think it's really good. Um, and so it's really to conserve high quality natural areas as the city grows to provide environmental benefits and recreational opportunities that support economic development and enhance the livability and desirability of Fort Worth. <clears throat> and so we all know that Fort Worth has experienced rapid population growth over the last 20 years. And now we're the 13th largest city and we have over 910,000 people here. And so as the city grows and develops, of course, we're going to, uh, to develop over these open spaces across the city. And so right now, based off of our, our pre-COVID estimates, <laughs> um, is that it looks like around 50 acres a week of undeveloped land is actually lost for new developments. So that's land that's um, ag use or old homesteads typically, and that becomes newly platted, uh, making its way for new development. <clears throat> and so the work that Trust for Public Land is gonna do for us is really going to help us strategically identify and prioritize potential natural areas for conservation. And all of the benefits of open space um, are consistent with city council's identified strategic goals and they meet multiple public policy objectives. Uh, open space conservation is also supported by the community. Next slide, Robert. 
So in 2019, the city of Fort Worth did a community survey. We asked a whole lot of different questions and got um, participation from all of our council districts. And so one of the questions we asked about in 2019 was about open space and how people felt about the acquisition of it. And, um, and so 81% of respondents said that they were supportive or very supportive of efforts to increase the amount of open space in the city. So this was definitely very exciting. This was in 2019. And so honestly, I'm thinking right now with COVID and all of us locked in our house, uh, this number is probably either, you know, pretty similar or it might be even higher um, as people are really looking for opportunities to safely get out, get out of their homes, um, and get out into the natural environments to just escape from this COVID situation. Next slide. <clears throat> so there's many different uh, plans that the city of Fort Worth has adopted that talk about open space and talk about open space goals and objectives, but there's right now no overarching citywide criteria on how that open space is actually strategically identified and prioritized across the city. And so we have our overall city comprehensive plan and our comprehensive plan um, uh, basically talks about all these other plans that you see up here on the screen. And so we want to really take a look at these plans and we are taking a look to see and they're helping us inform our open space conservation program. So we really see what is important. So if we go to the next slide, it's just kind of one example. So this is um, our comprehensive plan and it's some text that we pulled out of it that really talk about the needs for protecting open space. So as you can see, uh, the comp plan talks about the importance of stormwater conveyance, riparian buffers, greenways and trails, trees, unique vistas, um, the health of our streams and lakes. So using all of these reports, we are we're pulling out this information so we can really see how high how high quality high priority open space what types of features and uses it has what benefits we're looking at so all of this is really being used to help inform the development of our prioritization tool that the trust for public land is helping us build next slide <clears throat> So really, I, I flashed those, um, those reports up on the screen pretty quickly, but what we want to know from y'all um, is write it in the chat box or the comment form is, are there any other plans that we might have missed that we should look at so we're aware of other overlapping objectives towards open space? And so if you know of a plan that we should look at, um, either from your organization or something else that's relevant to the City of Fort Worth open space and, and goals and that kind of thing. If you can put it in your chat box and then we can take a look at it. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, an overview of our planning team. And so I did say I was a stormwater program manager, but this is definitely not a stormwater led effort. Uh, this is a interdepartmental collaborative effort. And so this is really exciting to, to work on this is because we've got such a big group, as you can see on the screen, of team members and we come together weekly and we talk about open space and, and, and talk about where we wanna be as a city with open space and look at different opportunities for land conservation. And then we also have got partners, several of them that I mentioned earlier, um, the North Central Texas Council of Government, Streams and Valleys, and Tarrant Regional Water District. Um, and we are working with them so we can collaborate. They've got lots of uh, similar overlapping objectives. And so that's really great is we want to be able to work with as many groups as possible to really make um, our program a reality. Next slide. So potential funding sources. Yeah, thank you. I forgot to check the uh, animation. So um, what we've done as a city is we've started looking at different funding sources and Trust for Public Land is gonna help us uh, really understand the current funding sources we have and what other funding sources that you don't even see on the screen. Um, and so really we want to try to get out of the box and look at any type of way that we can fund um, the acquisition of open space. And we've got several um, different types of funding listed on the slide that have to be used to meet special needs. So for example, 
water department money has to first meet the water department's use. Uh, just like stormwater utility, it's got to benefit the drainage system. Uh, park land dedication fee it has to fit within the right park land dedication area of the city. Environmental, the money has to be used for surface water quality protection. Um, but what we feel like is that open space meets all of these different needs. And so if we can really look at uh, the different multi-objective uses of a property, that's what we want to do. We want to try to identify properties that can provide multiple benefits uh, to the city of Fort Worth community. Next slide. So talking about funding, uh, this is really exciting. So our program, really we kicked this off, I think it was in August of 2019. And just in June, so not too many months later, we actually acquired our first open space property. So it's this one you see here in red, um, and it's called Broadcast Hill, and it's around 50 acres, and it's got um, native prairie there. So it's exciting. There's a, not a lot of native prairie left in the Fort Worth area, but we been able to uh, preserve and protect this now for the community to go out there and, and to enjoy the habitat. And so this was made possible, uh, one, with using money from the city's mineral trust fund, and then also uh, the Friends of Tandy Hills uh, worked actively out here in this area. As you can see, this um, is adjacent to City of Fort Worth Parkland right now, Tandy Hills Nature area and so they actually raised over $60,000 to help with the purchase of this property. Uh, so this was a great uh, partnership collaborative opportunity with the community to make this possible. Next slide. Okay, so one of the questions that we get pretty often is what's the difference between open space and parkland? And so I just kind of wanted to touch on this a little bit and really Kind of the big difference, as you see at the bottom of the screen, is one is experiences. And so the photo on the left um, is some, as it's, it's not a park or anything, but it's an area of land, I think, on the southwest side of town, Bear Creek Ranch. And so as you can see, um, it's just more natural. You look at it, you don't see the facilities. It's more passive use, you know, walking trails. Um, you know, you see the habitat. And then on the right is a, a Village Creek Park. So a great city of Fort Worth Park. Um, but there you see the active use, you see the court, you see uh, the playground in the background. Another big difference is just when you look at it, it you can see right away it, it's how it's managed. And so you've got on the left a much more wild, um, unmaintained look versus you on the right, you've got you know the van very manicured cut grass um, look and feel. So those are really kind of the two big differences. Um, of course, we do have, I mean, lots of city of Fort Worth that have uh, parks that have nice natural areas, but they're not managed specifically for those, except for a few, like the Nature Center is one example that it is managed for. And so that's what we're really looking at for open space are natural areas where we are first um, managing for that natural resources for that natural habitat that's out there. <clears throat> uh, let's see, the last one I wanted to mention too is just kind of another difference is that as we're looking at locations of open space, we're thinking about the economic benefits to the community that that open space could provide. And so parks are a little bit different. Of course, there's economic benefits of parks, but when we're looking at parks, we're looking at where people are living and then providing uh, recreational facilities um, for those people in that area. So it's a little bit different too. Next slide. <clears throat> so y'all are all here today, you know, you're like, why? So I wanna <laughs> just make sure everyone, you know, is here um, because we want you to be here and we wanna hear from you. Uh, so we really want to hear from you and your groups. We want you to represent the group that you're from, the community that you live in or that you work with. Um, to really help us mold and shape our open space conservation program. Um, two, we want you to share this information that you learned today uh, with your um, memberships, with your organizations. Um, we'll talk about, Matt will talk about a public survey in a little bit. We really want y'all to help us promote that public survey so we can get people fill, to fill it out so we can hear what others have to say. Uh, we want you to provide information that maybe your, your organization has that we don't know about that will help us in terms of coming up with our mapping tool, looking at 
maybe how we could look at our policies differently to encourage open space conservation um, and you know different funding sources that might be available for us to use. And then also we want you to provide us input on the modeling goals that are going to be used to incorporate the um, to come up with the online mapping tool. And then in the future, uh, we want you to take a look at the preliminary results, help us vet them. Do they make sense? Um, and then two, really looking at, we want you to learn how to use the mapping tool. So this is going to be a website that's going to be available for everyone to use. Uh, so we want this to not just benefit the city of Fort Worth, but for your organizations as well, it'll be a great source of data that you could possibly use to help um, in, in terms of meeting your organization's um, goals and objectives as well. So with that, I want to go ahead and hand this off to uh, Robert Kent, who is the Trust for Public Land Texas Director, and he's going to talk um, some about their scope of work. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, we're so glad to have everyone here today. My name is Robert Kent, and I am the Texas State Director for the Trust for Public Land. We're so happy to be partnering with the City of Fort Worth on this important project. If you haven't heard of our organization, we are a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is summed up by this phrase here, land for people. We believe that people and their communities are transformed when they have close to home access to parks, nature, and the outdoors. We have four key services that we provide for the communities where we work. The first is planning work. We help communities plan for their conservation priorities, which is what we're talking about today with the City of Fort Worth. Our second service is what we call funding, and we help communities raise public and private funds so that they can actually go out and pay for their conservation work. Um, as the saying goes, conservation without money is just conversation. And uh, we always try to find ways to bring money that can help um, achieve these goals. The third service that we provide is land protection. We actually have a team of real estate professionals who are experts at negotiating land acquisition deals, putting together the players so that we can um, take these beautiful places that are in private ownership and bring them over to public stewardship for the long term. And the last service we provide is what we call CREATE. And this is where we actually help create new parks and natural areas by working with communities to design those parks and natural areas so it provides the amenities and the services that they want to see. The work is important, and I think you all understand this for a number of reasons. We really summarize these in four key areas. The first is health. We know that when people have close to home access to parks and nature, they're healthier. They get outdoors and they use those parks and uh, they end up seeing improved health outcomes. I think we're all experiencing that right now with the amount of park usage that we're seeing during these uh, days of uh, having to shelter in place and not um, be able to visit the gym. We're all using our parks and natural areas more and it's making us healthier. The second benefit of why it matters is the environment. Again, we all know that when we have parks and natural areas and open spaces nearby, they can actually improve the environment, whether that is by filtering stormwater, improving water quality, uh, combating the urban heat island effect to keep neighborhoods cool in summertime heat waves, um, or any other type of environmental benefit that comes from having more nature nearby. The third reason this work matters is equity. Um, we support helping to overcome historically underinvested and helping marginalized groups to create access to the outdoors. Um, and by intentionally working with these communities. And the fourth benefit, which may be the most important, is community. We know that when we engage the community, we create the community. And part of what we're doing here today is to engage with you so we can make sure that this work is community-driven and community-oriented. Like I said, we're a national nonprofit organization and we work from coast to coast, main street to mountaintop. Since our founding in 1972, we've created over 5,000 new parks and natural areas, protected over 3 million acres, created over $80 billion in public funding for parks and conservation. And today, about 9 million people live within a 10 minute walk of a park, trail, or natural area that we've created. Of course, we have a rich legacy of work here in Texas as well, stretching back to 1979, where we've protected more than 40,000 acres of our most important natural areas including 1,800 acres right here in North Texas, a place that uh, I think about often is Eagle Mountain Lake Park, uh, just north of Fort Worth, um, where about 15 years ago, we played a key role in making sure that that park stayed open to the public. 
Before we get further, I do want to introduce our great team that we have working with the City of Fort Worth on this project. Uh, like I said, my name is Robert Kent. Um, my colleague, Mitch Hannon, who isn't able to join us today, he is our senior GIS analyst, and he's a, a whiz when it comes to computer mapping and computer modeling. Tosh Shotland, who is on the line. Tosh is one of our policy experts who will be writing a lot of the policy proposals and recommendations for this project. Tosh, if you just want to give a wave. We also have Matt Moffa with us today, who's our senior conservation planning project manager. Uh, Matt just waved and he'll be working on the survey and the public engagement part of this project. Jessica Welch, who's on our conservation finance team. Um, I don't think she's on the line today, but she'll be also working on the policy proposals. And finally, Brendan Shane, who's our climate director, who will also be working on the policy parts of this project. So let's talk a bit about the Trust for Public Land's role in this program. Um, as Jennifer said, this is a partnership with the City of Fort Worth, and we're so thrilled to get to work with them. Our role in this project is to really help the city understand what are the most high priority locations in Fort Worth to consider for open space acquisition and conservation. The way that we're doing that is by using computer assisted GIS mapping, which will help pull out literally using hundreds of data sets, the best places where if the city were to protect that natural area or open space, it would have all types of benefits for the surrounding areas. We'll actually do a demo of what that tool looks like here in a few minutes. The other key part of our work is to write a policy white paper that evaluates funding and different policy models that can support the implementation of this open space program. Our task and timeline, it's about a 12 month process that we're working on and the project actually kicked off in July of 2020, a few months ago, where we started working with Jennifer and Brandy and the rest of the open space working group from the city of Fort Worth to start determining the goals and criteria for the program. Since then, we've actually started that GIS analysis and mapping and prioritization and that work is well underway right now. All of that GIS and mapping will get loaded into what we call a decision support tool. Um, this is an interactive online website that the public can access um, through a lightly password protected platform to actually see the results of these findings. Our fourth task is that we'll take all of that information and put it into a public facing story map, uh, again on that website, which would be publicly accessible. Um, and it really condenses down the high level findings in a way that the average Fort Worth resident will be able to understand and uh, take away from. Our fifth task is that policy paper I mentioned earlier, um, where we'll be developing a final report that has all the feasibility and funding research and policy evaluations within it. Uh, that work is already underway. Um, we'll have that complete in June of 2021. And then on the back end, uh, we'll actually be providing two years of operating support for this project and well as an update for all the data. And then in 2023, we'll transition all of the data models and the website to the city. So the city can own and operate that tool, hosting it on their website uh, for the long term. So before we get too far, I want to talk about some of the cities that we're going to be looking at in our study to compare the city of Fort Worth to. Uh, these are what we call our benchmark cities and they evaluate best practices amongst similar cities. The five cities that we've landed on for this benchmarking study are Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, Oklahoma City, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, as you'll see, a lot of these are actually included as benchmark cities and other city of Fort Worth plans from the Stormwater Master Plan um, and the Economic Development Strategic Plan. We'll also be looking at what we call showcase cities. Um, and these are cities that really are the best in class when it comes to open space and natural area programs that we'll be pulling from to get those best ideas to bring to the city of Fort Worth. We'll be looking at Boulder, Colorado, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. So let's start talking about what are the actual goals that we're trying to solve here with open space. Um, the benefits from having natural areas in a city uh, go beyond just having nearby nature, which we all know is wonderful, but we actually have articulated seven specific modeling goals uh, that we look forward to getting your feedback on, um, as these are the benefits that we're looking for when we think about what can really make Fort Worth a great city through its open space program. So the first of these goals is what we call recreation, um, and this is pretty obvious. It's improving access to natural areas, protecting iconic landscapes and creating opportunities for people to get outdoors and enjoy nature. The second modeling goal is community health. 
Um, we know, like we said earlier, that when you have close to home access to nature and the outdoors, you have healthier people. And so we'll be looking for opportunities where by protecting and conserving open spaces and natural areas, we can improve health and provide opportunities for exercise, combat the urban heat island effect and improve air quality. We'll also look at equitable access to natural spaces. So finding opportunities to conserve natural areas that benefit low income, underserved and marginalized neighborhoods and communities. The fourth modeling goal we have is to look at flood control opportunities. So where can we conserve open spaces and natural areas that protect against flooding and property damage and can also absorb runoff and provide natural areas for stormwater to collect. The fifth modeling goal we're looking at will be stream, river, and lake health. So this will be looking for ways that we can use natural areas to filter stormwater, reduce runoff and erosion, and protect water quality in the city's streams, lakes, and the Trinity River. Our sixth goal is economic development. We know that when you have natural areas nearby, you can actually improve property values and create opportunities for businesses, jobs, and residential development, and other types of economic activity around those natural areas. And our seventh and final modeling goal is ecosystem preservation. So this is conserving important environments such as woodlands, prairies, and wetlands, and protecting habitat for plants and wildlife. So from here, I'm actually going to do a demonstration of what this tool is going to look like, and all these maps will look like once they're complete. I'll be showing a similar project that we built for the city of Dallas. So I hope everyone can see my screen here showing our Fort Worth Open Space Conservation Program website. So this is a website that's actually already live, which you can visit right now if you go to fortworthopenspace.org. And here you'll have access to all types of different documents about the project, some information about it. And eventually, once this project's open, we'll have the mapping portal will be available here as well. This is, like I said before, a version of the map that we built for the city of Dallas. It functions a lot like Google Maps. You can zoom in and you can zoom in on different areas and explore different parts of the city. And then you can start turning on different data layers that can start to identify priorities for us. So for instance, in the city of Dallas, we wanted to look at where are those big urban heat islands in the city. And these areas that are highlighted here actually show where the biggest urban heat islands are. And these are the places where if you were to protect open spaces and protect natural areas, you could help keep neighborhoods cool and help keep uh, combat that urban heat island effect. Another one I'll show is our stormwater and flooding analysis. So this map here, the areas that are highlighted are showing what are the parts of the city of Dallas that have the biggest impact on stormwater and flood control throughout the city. Again, these would be opportunities where if there's existing open space to protect that open space so that it doesn't get covered in asphalt and concrete, which could then cause further flooding and erosion downstream. One of the neat, part, neat parts about the tool is that we can run very particular parcel reports. So I could click on a piece of land and it gives me all types of information um, about how many acres it is, which ones of our criteria does it meet, how does it impact different modeling goals. And then I can even create a custom PDF report from this, which will then be available to pull out so you can make further decisions from it. So the whole goal from all of this work is so that we can help the city of Fort Worth make data-driven and data-informed decisions about how it moves forward with its conservation and open space priorities. If you'd like to, we'll send this deck out afterwards, and I encourage you to visit the website. You can log into the tool for yourself and try it out and uh, see what you think about it. So at this point, I'm going to pass this off to my colleague, Matt Moffa, who's going to talk about the public survey. It's really important that we get your input and feedback into this process early so we make sure that all of the modeling and all of the analysis and research we're doing is responsive to Fort Worth needs. Matt? Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Robert, and thanks for everyone for participating today. So as Robert mentioned, uh, this community engagement is really important to us, and this survey is currently live. <clears throat> it will allow us to get a lot of different types of feedback from residents, uh, what types of amenities they would like, activities, whether or not they're interested in volunteering in open space, and we'll actually even give them the opportunity to comment on the GIS criteria, and we'll incorporate that into the mapping through the weighting. Uh, so this is live today. 
and we are planning it on closing it by the end of November. And one other note, this does have um, <coughs> a background section on the participants asking things like demographic info as well as zip code. Uh, it's really important to us. We hear from people all over Fort Worth. So we'll definitely need your help to help push this out and just make sure we're really hearing from everyone through this process. Uh, and from there, I'll hand it off to Brandy Cup. Okay, so um, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier when um, we uh, mentioned that we were looking at different policies that go into open space planning and um, this would be things that we'd be looking at uh, like future land use and as we preserve open spaces around the city we could increase the density of development around those areas to give more people access so um, that's one topic that we're looking to get going um, pretty much right away as far as a small group and uh, some other things that we're going to be looking at grants foundation and funding uh, we kind of looked at that a little bit earlier and also how we would maintain and manage these spaces um, you know they're not going to require uh, the same level of mowing and planting and things like that as, as our manicured parks, but there would definitely be a lot of opportunities for volunteers to do things like invasive species removal, uh, trail maintenance and things like that. So we are looking at uh, for anyone on this call or maybe some of your partners who might be interested in doing a little bit deeper dive with us on some of these uh, topics and this would be a little bit longer term commitment so if this is something that sounds like it would be interesting to you and again we would break out these groups based on topic and and subject matter expert area uh, please send me an email and i would love to speak with you about um, getting these meetings set up like i said especially that policy and development impacts uh, group. We're looking at getting that going right away so Robert's team can develop their white paper uh, on that topic. All right, Robert, next slide. And so um, ways that you can help. Uh, we are looking for our stakeholders to help share out that survey with their networks. So we are asking you to get on your social media accounts and in your newsletters and emails and help us send that survey out. We want to reach as many people in the city of Fort Worth as possible because we want a good representation across all areas of the city and all demographics. And that's one reason that even though it's not required, we really recommend people to fill out those uh, demographic questions at the end of the survey. So we'll know for sure that we've reached everywhere in the city. And uh, we've got our public meeting coming up on October 22nd. And we want to, again, encourage as many people to attend that as possible so they can learn about this program and potentially get involved with this. Like I said, there will be opportunities later for volunteerism. So you'll be getting some emails from me uh, after this meeting with the links to the survey, as well as some um, and tags that you can use on social media and um, I'll share our accounts with the city um, so you can go in and, and grab our posts that we're making and share those out to your network as well. Try and make it e as easy as possible on you. <laughs> okay so now it's time for open discussion and um, I do have some questions that came up uh, from our chat. Do we want to go ahead and tackle those first? That might make sense. Go through the chat questions and then that'll spark some more conversation, I'm sure. Absolutely. So the first question was, who is Streams and Valleys? And a lot of our uh, participants may not know who you are. Stacy, do you want to give us a quick overview? Hi, everybody. How are you all? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. 
Super. Well, so since 1969, Streams and Valleys has been the nonprofit steward, voice, and advocate for the Trinity River. And so we work with the city and the Tarrant Regional Water District on trail connections and access, beautification, um, and anything that can uh, add to the efforts that our two governmental partners are already doing. And so it's been our pleasure to have uh, the Trust for Public Land as a partner as well and the COG and um, we're just looking to make the river system and the watershed better and better all the time. Thank you, Stacy. Did and that then answer the question? <laughs> I believe so. I believe so. And then also note on your read ahead materials, I included a link to the streams and valleys confluence plan and that'll give you a much uh, deeper dive into their organization. I might just add Brandy in terms of confluence. I mean that was a couple of your effort and a lot of the city folks played a huge tremendous part in that. It's a big plan, it's a 10-year plan, it's a watershed plan and boy are there a ton of opportunities for anybody who's interested to get involved in that. So we, if you, if you are interested, if you have questions, please reach out anytime um, via email or, or phone. And, um, and I'd love to talk to you more about the vision for the watershed and, and what we can all do together. Absolutely. One of the things that uh, we looked at when we first kicked this program off back in last fall was we picked up the Confluence Plan to kind of learn um, what y'all had identified to kind of kickstart our efforts. So definitely so many linkages and collaboration opportunities there. Yeah, it's pretty exciting, really. Um, and it's great to have so many good partners. So uh, thanks again for including me in this group and, um, and for helping us envision how we can just get better and better all the time. Thanks, Stacey. What else do we have, Brandy? So Pedro Garcia from uh, Republic actually asks if we've considered conserving some land in preparation for the disposal of waste generated from aggressive population growth. And I know that currently we are looking at open space conservation really from a preservation angle. We want to maintain and keep these spaces as open, um, but it is something to consider and something that we would look at the uh, solid waste master plan that was developed in 2017 um, if we decide to go down that route. Anything to add, Eric or Jennifer, on that one? Um, I mean, so I'll touch on, that's definitely something obviously, you know, that the city of Fort Worth is always looking at is making sure that we're prepared. As I said, you know, our community is growing. And so, you know, what are the growing pains is the ability to us uh, to store our trash. So I will say though, that in terms of our open space program is we're really trying to look at those areas that are the highest quality, best areas that we can really keep natural. Um, and, but as we identify those, we, we can kind of see, okay, the ones that aren't, maybe those would be better uh, for something like sanitation. So definitely that's the really cool thing about this, um, this modeling and mapping website is that we'll all have the ability to use that information to all help our different organizations make decisions. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of layers in here that are going to have great benefit, not just for the city, but for all of our partners involved. I'm really excited to see our urban canopy report and um, flooding reports and um, water quality. All of those things are gonna be in here um, and your organizations are going to be able to go in and take a look at that. So it should really benefit all of us. And then, oh, this is a great question. What is the difference between a natural area such as Tandy Hills and open space? And so I'd say here we're kind of using those interchangeably. I think sometimes when we say natural area, it may have more of a connotation like a prairie or a forest or a wetland, but really we're using those um, kind of interchangeably in this sense. Yeah, and I will, I will say uh, that that's one of the questions, as I said, you know, that's a, that is an official park uh, and these open spaces will not be official parkland, um, but definitely, you know, the purpose is for them to benefit the community. So one of those is, you know, the use of them um, as appropriate. Of course, it depends on, you know, where the property is located and what what's actually out there. Um, but but these will be a little bit different than parkland. Uh, but we've talked, uh, we work very closely with parks. We've got, you know, parks members engaged in our team. 
And so we've also talked about the ability to take park money and open space money and leverage them together to find properties that meet both our multiple objectives, so all these uh, different environmental benefits and economic benefits of open space, as well as the benefits of parkland in the specific parts of town that really need that, uh, the recreational use in those areas. And this is another reason that pr public survey is so important because we do want to know uh, what types of activities our residents and community members are asking for because there, there are recreational opportunities available with open space like hiking, mountain biking, um, bird watching, things like that. So um, that is part of the sub uh, survey that we're sending out. Oh, uh, this is for your team, Robert. Can you provide the guest user code for the GIS system and is it active to where uh, we can see the mapping areas? And I'm assuming they're talking about the Dallas model, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, happy to share the guest access code for the Dallas uh, website. The Fort Worth uh, map is still being developed as we speak. So it'll be several months yet before we're able to share the Fort Worth data. But if you'd like to look at the uh, Dallas tool, I'll put all that detail in the chat. And then in the follow-up me email, we'll send out um, the link and access code as well. And then the next one, do you have a scope summary and survey link that would make the survey easy to share? And yes, we do. So the um, landing page that Robert was showing you earlier, uh, we will be sharing that out to all of our uh, stakeholders on this call. And then um, can these areas that need to be reclaimed and restored, so, oh, oh, sorry, can these be areas that need to be reclaimed and restored, uh, for example, the Bailey sump? And so um, we are looking for those highest quality natural areas, um, but I, th I think this is something that we've definitely talked about in some of our meetings and, and looking at, um, mitigation, land banking, those types of things. So I, it is on our radar, but currently we are really trying to focus on those areas that can be preserved as is. And, and that's um, one reason of that is just, it's a significant cost to take land. Um, I'm thinking Bailey Stump, there's a whole lot of industrial land to take that and to reconvert it to natural areas. And so really what, what we're hoping to do is to find those natural areas that are really great quality first and then keep them from becoming um, areas that become developed. It's much, much, much more easier um, and cost effective to, to grow versus to recreate that habitat. But, uh, but that definitely has come up uh, as something to think about. And please keep in mind that the city of Fort Worth has a brownfields program. So if you have any questions or are interested in brownfields, uh, please reach out to me and let me know and I will put you in contact with our coordinator, Haley Mann, uh, here in Environmental and she can uh, discuss that program with you further. We do have some grants and funding available um, associated with brownfields redevelopment. Okay, and then next question, will any development be allowed in these areas? And um, I think by development, we're talking about smaller scale benches, trails, any hardscape or impervious materials at all. And so this is something that we've talked about. Um, I definitely think that passive recreation opportunities um, we, are, we would be looking at. And this would be akin to something that you might see at Marion Sansom, like the mountain biking and hiking trails that are out there. Um, but we've also asked if people would like some of the hardscape, um, especially to make open spaces more accessible. And so that is, again, something that's been incorporated into the public survey. Uh, Jennifer, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think the biggest difference kind of talking about open space versus parkland is I think you can basically expect to go to one of these areas and not see a big mode maintained mm -hmm. sport. They're just a big area of open Bermuda grass where people can go and like throw, you know, a frisbee. Um, so I actually went to the opening of Broadcast Hill and my daughter wanted to play with a frisbee and we couldn't find it because of all the great natural prairie that was out there. So, so it's not a place to go do that, but it is a place, you know, to go and, you know, do your walking and, you know, wildlife viewing and photography or, you know, just go, go and get, do a picnic out there. So oh, as Brandy said, much more passive, passive uses. Um, but yeah, that's what we want your, the 
the community's feedback on and what types of uses and what types of small facilities would you like to see out there? And related, will vehicles and commercial activities be prohibited at open space acquisitions? Um, I don't think we anticipate paved parking lots and things of that nature, um, other than you know something that you would see maybe at the nature center to get out to those areas. Um, but it hasn't really come up. Um, as far as commercial activities, we may look at things like um, kayak rentals or something similar that would allow you to um, enjoy the open space and again kind of utilize it for recreation purposes. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is going to be kind of a case by case depending on, you know, what habitat is out there and location and so forth. So Brandy, I know we have some folks with their hands raised. I think uh, maybe we can allow them to speak their question. Uh, absolutely, so, absolutely. We've got so many more coming in, I can barely keep up. <laughs> uh, Gina Bird, I'm gonna unmute you. And if you wanna ask your question um, over uh, your audio, and then we'll try to answer it. And it looks like you're still, okay, there we go. Go right ahead, Gina. Good afternoon. Uh, I am with the NAACP and I had a couple of questions about your urban heat outlets and storm, storm water and flooding. You said that GIS mapping that you have, it is not succinct for Fort Worth, but you, do you have an idea of where some of those outlets are or do we have to wait for the system to be up? And uh, my second one is, what are the policies that, uh, that you're trying to get into? Because I would like to be a part of that. Uh, we have a team, I actually have a team with the NAACP and I also have a veterans team. I'm a, a Marine Corps veteran. We have another team that does the parks, the cleanups, all of those things. We work in Arlington and Dallas and we're trying to find those areas for Fort Worth. So do you have uh, those things? Well, I'll uh, tackle your first question, Gina. So I think you're asking, do we have the stormwater data and flooding data for Fort Worth yet? Uh, and the answer is we are working on it and that's what we're building towards next year. So by the time that this project wraps in June, we will have all that data available to see. Um, at this point, we don't have data to show on that at, at today. Does that answer your first question? Yes, it does. Okay, wonderful. And your second question, were you looking for ways that you or some of your um, network could volunteer with this project? Is that correct? Yes, we have a couple of groups and I've been aligned with uh, Brandy and the environmental. We wanted to do to adopt a, a spot, but it seems like this one is conducive to our, uh, more conducive to our plan. The same things uh, for maintenance and maintaining uh, those areas that you were talking about. We can get a team of people out there to uh, maintain the trails, the hikes, that's more up our area. And with our veterans group, we have a little, a couple of dollars where we do that with. So that'll be perfect for us to start volunteering and doing some of those things. And uh, with the NAACP, I wanted to get more into the policies because that's what we're working on with the Sierra Club and a few other environmental groups uh, with policy right. for some of these environmental uh, aspects. So we align with most of your goals there. I love it. So uh, two responses and then I'll have uh, Jennifer and Brandy add as well. Um, so for the veterans group and any other group that wants to work on volunteer maintenance, the survey has a place where you can fill out, you know, yes, I'd be interested. So go ahead and fill that out, put your contact details in there and we can follow up with you. And then we're also envisioning that there will be some type of volunteer component of this open space program once it is up and running next year. To your second question about the policy piece, absolutely. I think the small group, Brandy, might be a good place for Gina and the NAACP to get involved? Absolutely. I think both with the policy group and with our volunteer group, um, we want volunteerism to be a component of this, but it is something that we are going to be building from the ground up. So we would definitely love to hear impact, uh, input from our uh, groups that are working in the community. And then as far as the policies, a lot of what we're going to be focusing on would be um, development policies. And Eric, do you want to talk about some of the things that we've mentioned in some of our group meetings? Sure, one of the opportunities that open space provides, and um, Robert did touch on this and, um, and Jennifer as well, 
uh, is that uh, the open space itself, even if it is not developed, uh, and the intention of the open space program would be not to develop that property, but what it does is it influences the value of the property that surrounds those open space locations. And it also creates opportunities for uh, different kinds of development to go in adjacent to an open space to take advantage of that. Um, and you can think about um, uh, maybe a, a sort of a mixed use area that might go in on vacant land that's adjacent to a, a you know, a high quality open space uh, that might attract uh, a mix of uses and, you know, perhaps a, a cafe with, you know, with seating that overlooks the open space, something like that. So as an economic development tool, it plays that role. Um, it really provides opportunities for development to occur, not within the open space that's protected, but on adjacent locations. So we'll be working Gina. with Eric's team and Robert and their team on, on policy considerations, considerations that we want to go into it. <laughs> Gina, any other questions we can answer for you? Not at the moment. Thank you. You guys were great. Thank you. So let's move to Melissa Kanoor. I think I got your last name right, Melissa. Let's see, Melissa is muted. Let's see if we can get her unmuted. Okay. There we go. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Sorry. Um, I'm Melissa Conor. I'm the planning director at downtown Fort Worth Inc. And I think I've met most of you before or some of you. Um, I'm really excited about this project and the planning that you guys are doing. I think it's so, so important and critical. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, I did have a question. It may have been quasi answered already, but I'm going to be a little bit more pointed about it. I think there was a question earlier about sanitation and um, I guess sanitation, right? And so I know that there's a distinction between open space and parks, but I just want to know, is this survey and study going to look at municipal uses? And if there's a way to consolidate municipal uses and allow for additional open space, either on site or as part of a development for a new facility that may or may, that may be needed. So the example I would use is and I'm a former New Yorker, so a long, long time ago, but the sanitation plant on, in East Harlem, uh, uh, sorry, on the west side of Harlem, where they literally built a plant and built a park on top of it. And I know we're talking about passive <laughs> open space, but there's no reason you couldn't build a big facility that has a big roof and plant, you know, plants that attract monarch butterflies or wildlife or what have you. So I just, I raised that because I think it's something that we need to do better as a city is thinking through our municipal uses that we need, but also how to conserve and consolidate as well. And so I'm going to try to answer that. So I would say that the tool that TPL is developing for us will be able to be used by all of the city departments to really help us in terms of identifying properties that are best for our uses. So I mean, what spaces, what we're going to be looking at our program specifically at those natural areas, which are those best high priority natural areas for us to keep natural. But then the sanitation department might use it to look at, okay, which areas would be best for us in terms of sanitation or stormwater program can look at it and see which ones are the ones that rank highest for helping reduce flooding. So that's the great thing about this tool is it can help us at the city as well as uh, other organizations really help prioritize and identify the best properties uh, for their needs when looking at all these different benefits that they can provide to the community. Okay, thank you. Does that and answer your question? I mean, sort of. I guess I'm just looking for it to dig deeper. I really would love to be able to come up, maybe it's a policy question as that gets raised and discussed. How do we, once we build a facility, is there a way even on site to conserve a portion of the site or, I mean, it's in theory, it's city owned land that they already have access to and already own. And so is there a way to better utilize that site is just, I guess the question. So 
That could definitely come up as part of, um, you know, policy discussion. I would see that more of a green infrastructure, low impact development type discussion, which is related, but not necessarily part of the open space program, but it's definitely, um, it, it, it is definitely adjacent to open space. So I, I definitely think there's room for that discussion. And uh, please note that Edith uh, Marvin from the COG uh, put a follow up in our chat box regarding uh, regional solid waste uh, discussions that they're working on right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, I did want to add too is that we can pass that comment along. I mean, to me, I think what you're saying has a lot to do with just when the city of Fort Worth builds a facility, we should be looking at the property and entirely and strategically planning how that facility is built. Um, so, you know, if there's habitat out there, can we build around the habitat, um, you know, and preserve what's there versus just leveling it all and then putting it back. So trying to be more strategic, is that kind of helping, does that cover part of it? Part of it, and I think it's also are there other uses that can be co-located there so that you're um, in theory, not just, um, you know, we're a growing city and we have a lot of land, but we might not always have that. And so is there a need to co-locate the parks department with TPW facilities at the same location? I'm, you know, just things like that, that might make it easier as opposed to just building a building that's too big and yeah. <laughs> takes up more land than it needs to or what have you. And I think yeah. the other- the Hillshire, um, the Hillshire drop-off station is an excellent example of that where we combined a drop-off station with um, an animal care control facility and on the bays over the recycling drop-off you have solar panels and out front there's a bioswale. So I, I definitely think that it's something on our radar because we're working with our energy manager and other groups in the city on that type of development for sure, especially internally. Right, and I guess I would add to that land that the county or other, uh, you know, municipal or, you know, friendly users use. <laughs> Great, thank All you. All right, thank you, Melissa. Yep. So we're going to go now to Joe Schneider here. Oh, go right ahead, Joe. I believe I'm unmuted. We yes. can hear you. Cool. So a couple of things. One, thanks to everybody uh, for getting together on this, and thanks to all the volunteers who are going to be helping with this as it moves through. Uh, obviously, public input is going to be very important, and in watching the progression of the slides, it looked like y'all have one public meeting on October 22nd. Did I read that? Is that going to be the only one, or will there be more uh, in addition to opportunities? I mean, that's, you know, a couple of weeks away, I realize, but Still not Great. much time to get the word out to a whole lot of folks. So yeah, so there will be more uh, public meetings. So kind of our plan was to have three stakeholder meetings throughout kind of now, one in the middle of the process and one near the end. Um, and at the same way, have uh, public meetings kind of that follow each of those meetings. So we wanna make sure that we're engaging the public throughout so we can have continuous opportunities uh, to get their feedback and answer their questions. Okay, good, good. And then with regards to the, uh, the survey that is going to be sent out or available, is that something we'll be able to forward and they'll just be able to go and do it? Or is that something that they're going to have to have some kind of coding to get into it? Yeah, okay. it's going to be available for everybody. So I'll, okay. I will send out the link uh, and some social media a little. So make it super easy. All you have to do is go to the website. And we, we made sure we fixed our initial glitch. So even multiple computers, you know, a husband and then their kids can all take it afterwards. Uh, so you can submit it multiple times if you have people sharing a computer at the library and so forth. Okay, okay. In fact, these are the links right here. So if you want right. to revisit it right now, feel free to type these in and I'll um, put these links into the chat as well. Okay, that'll be great. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. So Brandy, perhaps we move to, it looks like we've had all the raised hands um, move forward. So perhaps we go to the Q&A. Yes, and I had um, a couple of other questions come in um, through the chat window. 
Um, one that just popped up is, does this group see any potential with utilizing some of the open spaces for urban agricultural use? If so, what might that look like? So I am assuming we're talking about uh, more urban farming uh, here. And I that is not something I believe we have discussed because we are trying to keep this more passive. Um, but I think that is something that um, could be put into the survey as a comment, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I like, I mean, and I, I agree. I think, you know, of course, you know, your, your property that you buy, it, you know, it's going to have different types of features on it, but definitely I think that's a really cool, you know, concept. So I, we encourage you to take the survey, fill it in or put it on your comment card and we can talk about that some more. Okay, and it says, is there a plan in place to keep open space acquisitions protected and in good condition? And that is exactly what we're going to be working on as we develop the tool. We're working really closely with our parks department to figure out what maintenance um, on these areas looks like. And if you are interested in that topic, please reach out to me because, again, I want to put together a small group uh, specifically on maintenance, volunteerism, and um, what that looks like going forward. Absolutely. Okay, and I think that just about covers everything that came in uh, from so the Brandy, chat box. <laughs> yep, and we've now got the Q&A box, uh, which we've got about nine or ten questions in there. Okay. Um, I'll just read these off to you. Uh, the first is from Gina Alexander asking, will we place this presentation on the website? It has a rich history and context to share with others. Yeah, I think, can you do that, Robert? Put yeah, the happy to. recording this meeting. So yeah, we could upload that. It's a good idea. Okay, next question is from Suzanne Tuttle. Will acquisition still be pursued, uh, pursued before the TPL project is completed? And so that is something uh, that we, we've talked about and we did not want to just say, we're gonna you know, wait until this tool. But if, uh, if there's some properties that come up, you know, our team is taking a look at them as they arise to look and see, uh, do they fit our criteria based off the information that we have. Definitely, you know, we won't have uh, the strategic tool that TPL is creating, but that doesn't make, mean that we don't have information and we can't, we can use that information we have right now to make decisions. So if there's a good opportunity, we definitely don't want to lose it if there's a chance. Great. Uh, this is just recapping Joe's question. Will there be more than one public meeting for input? Uh, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Suzanne Tuttle again, is there any guarantee of perpetuity for keeping these properties as open space into the future? Conservation easements? So conservation easements uh, is a possibility. And so one thing we've talked about too is maybe the city doesn't need to go and acquire these lands. Maybe the property owner is willing to just put their property uh, into a conservation easement. And so uh, saving that property, then saving uh, the city as well. We're not having to purchase that, but that property uh, is maintained as open space for the benefit of the community forevermore. So yeah, definitely those are things we are looking at. And we're also looking at the implications of the city purchasing the open space if they owned the land itself what um, are the requirements for making sure that stays open space in perpetuity uh, just to Suzanne's question uh, Dan Viagas is wondering question for TPL can you provide an example of how open space planning improved accessibility to open spaces for underserved populations as a matter of fact we can uh, looking at the work that we did in Dallas um, we used that data mapping tool to identify a number of priority pieces of land throughout the city uh, that were considered you know good opportunities for open space acquisition one of the filters that we looked at was through an equity lens uh, specifically looking at underinvested communities where there are not park access where there is um, a high proportion of households are considered low income um, etc and we found a 40 acre piece of land in southern Dallas in what's called the Highland Hills neighborhood. Uh, not only was it in a park desert, but it's also in an area with extreme health disparities. We purchased that piece of land with the city of Dallas last year, and now the Trust for Public Land is designing a park on that location that'll include health and wellness amenities specifically geared towards improving the health of that nearby neighborhood. Um, so that's a great example of how 
this data mapping tool can then go all the way through the acquisition and then park development phase as well. And that is, again, it's one of the criteria that you um, can rank on the public survey that's going out. Uh, but we have multiple data layers that are going in um, that are either directly related to equity or closely related, like Robert was mentioning, some of the health indicators. And so what we want to do is look at those communities that are underserved or have a lot of those health indicators and provide those passive recreational opportunities close by. And um, that's one way that open space can help address equity. And, um, you know, there's also those extra benefits that come along with it, like the um, mental health uh, benefits of, of nature. And so all of these things definitely play a role in this program. Uh, Suzanne Tuttle asks, will we be able to pursue anything in the ETJ? This was a question <laughs> that uh, we worked on quite a bit. Um, Jennifer, do you want to kind of come go through our history on this? Yeah, so I mean, just to make it short, um, so we are looking um, and, and open to considering ETJ opportunities. Um, so of course, you know, the big the thing is how do they benefit the city of Fort Worth? And we want to make sure we're benefiting our residents, even if it's not in the city of Fort Worth. So is it close to it? Uh, what are the benefits? So just one example that came up is, you know, there's, um, of course, you know, drainage. Drainage does not um, look at city boundaries, but if there's um, a flooding area that's downstream in the city of Fort Worth, and there could be an opportunity to purchase land that can be used to, to help slow that stormwater runoff and reduce flooding for our community, that could be one example um, of acquiring land in an ETJ. So that's one example. So it is something um, that we're looking at. Another thing just too that we talked about is for our tool, we don't have the level of information in the ETJ that we do for areas inside the city of Fort Worth. Um, so we talked about that as extensively. That's what Brandy was getting at. And so um, it's not going to be a pure apples to orange apples comparison when you look at ETJ in the city, but we're using um, the information that we have as much as possible in the ETJ uh, to help us better understand what's out there so we can see um, if it will help us achieve our, our goals. Great. John McFarlane had a question. He says, top priorities as I see them include one, expanding existing open space with contiguous parcels. For example, the Broadcast Hill acquisition was a great purchase. Two, increase access for environmental justice communities, minority and low income, which have historically lacked access to green space. Therefore, detailed demographic information would be required if not already included in the GIS tool. Did the panelists have thoughts on this? Um, so I'll take a first stab at that. Um, so on your first question about expanding existing open space with contiguous parcels, absolutely. Uh, we can very easily look at that. Um, in the survey, there are chances for you to leave comments, and so I encourage you to take the survey and leave this very comment, because that'll be useful feedback for us. To your second question about access, increasing access for environmental justice communities, um, absolutely, again, our equity filter and our equity lens does a very deep, thorough look at that. Um, we look at, we start with the environmental justice screen, which is what uh, the EPA uses, and then we'll build on that with other layers. Um, so we're making sure that we have really good, solid data um, to identify those parts of the city that could really benefit most from increased access to green space. Uh, Jennifer or uh, Brandy, any other additions? The only thing that I would add is, uh, too, is uh, um, making sure that we're looking just not at expanding, you know, big clumps of green space or where you already have it, but looking for areas of town that just don't have access to those right now. So definitely if there's areas um, that are underserved by parks or natural areas, you know, is it um, is there property in those areas that fit these criteria that could help meet the needs of those people? I would say that and also um, trail connectivity is definitely a consideration that we're looking at. Uh, we want to make those really long continuous expanses of trail because it encourages people to really get out and get active. So all of those criteria are included as, as part of the modeling tool. 
Okay, uh, Stefania Roberts asks, is there any infrastructure consideration for areas east of I-35 and the Rosedale corridor? Uh, we're looking at the entire city and we're also looking at the extra territorial jurisdiction, the ETJ as well. Um, so we will be looking at those areas along with every other part of the city of Fort Worth. Um, Gina Alexander asks, do you have any social media materials to assist in advertising the public meeting on uh, October 22nd? Brandy? Yes, so what I'm gonna do, I'll send everyone out um, some packages that you can use to advertise our um, public survey as well as the public meetings that are coming up um, to hopefully, hopefully make it a really turnkey operation for you to uh, share out with your networks. Great. Uh, Melanie Clay asks, where is the meeting on the 22nd? Brandy and Jennifer? So that'll be another virtual meeting uh, just to keep everybody safe. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be working to get a, a link set up for that meeting. I'm not sure of the platform yet, but that will be something that we will um, be sharing soon. So I think the big thing is to hold that date and to hold the time, I believe it's six o'clock on the 22nd. Uh, and we will post that uh, information on the city of Fort Worth calendar on our website and send that out to all of uh, all of y'all um, and our team. So I agree that's something that we need to, to get that set up pretty quickly. Great, thank you. Sharon Hamilton asks, what is an ETJ? Uh, that stands for the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, should have uh, clarified that bit of lingo before we threw it out there. Um, and it's essentially the area outside of city limits, but that the city of Fort Worth still has uh, some ability to work within. Eric, do you want to expand on that at all? I know you Sure, I can do that. Yeah, the extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, is basically an area that's authorized uh, by the state legislature for the city to have some planning role. Um, it, the city of Fort Worth and other cities are not allowed to have zoning in the extraterritorial jurisdiction because it's outside the city limits. We do work with uh, county governments, particularly uh, in plat reviews related to that, so new subdivisions that are proposed in the county. Um, the extraterritorial jurisdiction for Fort Worth extends five miles from the city limits. So large cities, it's a, it's a larger uh, area around the city. For a small city, it's, it's much smaller. Um, we have the authority to annex land within the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Having said that, uh, the state legislature in the past couple of sessions has severely restricted that opportunity. So City of Fort Worth is, is not annexing property in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Uh, at nearly the rate that it had in the past. Um, so that's the, the, you know, we have some ability to plan for that ultimate growth. Um, and we do so with future land use plans, with um, uh, things like looking at open space opportunities, looking at uh, master thoroughfare planning for future street alignments. But again, the, the opportunity to annex those areas and bring it into the city and develop it at sort of more urban uh, type densities is, is really been restricted. So that's a short course on ETJs. Thanks, Eric. Um, Melanie asks, is there anyone looking into which open areas are now currently overused and thus causing destruction to that area? Um, the GIS study will not be capturing that type of information uh, unless we can find some reliable data source about where there is consistent overuse. We may be able to find some information about dumping um, that can be pulled from police reports, uh, but that's only as good as the data is. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to yeah. tag on? Yeah, so that's really kind of how Brandy was talking about, you know, some of the groups and one of them is really the management and maintenance of, of these open spaces. And so we really want to be prepared that as we go and acquire uh, more of these areas over time, we're ready to, to um, respond to a lot of use. So, um, you know, as we said earlier, there's more and more people using these natural areas uh, because of COVID, and that's a great thing, but we want to make sure that they can handle it and that we are managing uh, these properties accordingly. So that's going to be 
um, a really um, important topic that we talk about and that TPL's uh, recommendations will talk about, you know, how, how that uh, should be handled. Yeah, there's a lot to go into there as far as um, funding, staffing, things like that. So it's something that we're going to have to develop um, as part of the plan for this program. Okay, um, John McFarland says, as one person mentioned, maybe a partnership with Tarrant County would be beneficial. Um, absolutely, happy to have them be a part of this. Right, and we've already been talking with Tarrant County about you know, some potential pro um, partnerships or some land opportunities that we thought you know, might be better you know, for them and we wanted to make sure that they were aware of it. So definitely, uh, they are a partner. Okay, Nancy. Uh, Jackowicz asks, how will the city address the impact enhanced open space has on increasing property values in low-income communities and concerns about involuntary displacement for renters and homeowners? Uh, that's a great question, uh, one that uh, we're always thinking about within the Trust for Public Land for everywhere that we work. Uh, Jennifer and Brandy, do you want to say a few words before I pass it to Taj to talk about the policy paper? I was going to say, I think this is going to definitely come up as part of the policy discussion. It's something um, that we know needs to be addressed. So um, I definitely think that's going to be a great topic for the small group to handle. Yeah, and, I, and just to kind of before Taj talks about it, I mean, definitely that is something that we want to think about. Um, but, you know, we really want to make sure that we are reaching out to our um, you know, marginalized, uh, low income and so forth communities and that they have the ability to, uh, to have access to the same types of places in other parts of the city. So we just need to be, uh, look, you know, look very well, a uh, very detailed look at the potential impacts uh, before we go out and acquire these properties. Taj? Taj? Yeah, I just share a, a couple things. So we have dedicated staff at the Trust for Public Land that are looking at this very topic because we get this question a lot and it's a big challenge with the work uh, when you're doing park planning and open space uh, conservation work. Um, so we'll definitely engage them. Um, one of our staff, Seema Karam, just uh, wrote sort of a white paper laying out a roadmap uh, for best practices um, to avoid displacement and gentrification from engagement and coalition building, um, workforce development, um, potentially some sort of specific policies as well. So we'll definitely bring her into this project and get her insights. Um, she's working with practitioners around the country that are looking at this work, um, looking at this challenge. So great and question. Seema just uh, moved back home to San Antonio. So um, she's uh, here in Texas. Awesome. All and right. that's, that's the great part of us engaging TPL um, to help us with this program as they bring so much, you know, both uh, uh, state of Texas and nationwide experience um, to us. So it's a great benefit for us to have them on board and helping us with this program. Well, we're down to it looks like our last question here. Um, this is from Gina Alexander. Would there be any translation available during the meeting in virtual format? Uh, I have not seen this in action, aside from the Fort Worth ISD meetings that are usually held in separate language specific session. Just wanted to inquire. Oh, that's a good one. So I, I guess you mentioned the, the language. So I think um, I would say right now we don't have anything planned, but if there is someone that would like access to this information that you're aware and they need it in a different language, then we would be happy to talk with them about it. Um, definitely, we want to make sure that this information is available to everyone. Um, and there is a Spanish version of the um, presentation of the survey. And so we we started out with the Spanish version. But definitely, if there's people um, that need special access to this information, we want to make it possible so we can uh, get their feedback and share the information with them. And Jennifer, I think she may have been asking specifically about the next meeting, the virtual meeting, or the. Uh, um, October 22nd meeting. Do you know oh. if there was, if someone requested uh, for that to be in Spanish, would the city be able to provide a Spanish translation of that meeting? Um, I think that we probably could do that. I, I don't think we could do it at the same time, but I guess we would take the meeting and then translate it after the fact. So if that's something 
um, that is needed, we can definitely look into getting that done. Yeah. Yeah, and any of the material that has been sent out, um, if you need Spanish versions of that, uh, we can work internally to get that translated. Okay, well, um, I don't see any more questions in the chat or the Q&A. I don't see any other hands raised. If you have any more questions, now's your time. Um, if you've been shy, feel free to uh, speak up now. Or otherwise, you can email any of us afterwards and we'd be happy to um, connect with you after the, after the fact. I think that's it. Uh, do we have any, I think this is the last slide. Robert, or maybe we have our contact information at the end. So, and uh, so I just want to thank you all again for joining us today, uh, for sticking with us. I, um, I'm so excited. It looks like at one point I wrote down how many people we had on the call and then I lost it. 79 people. So I'm super excited that there's so much interest in the city's open space program and we're so excited that uh, that y'all are along for the ride and that you're here to, to help us uh, really mold and craft this program into something uh, that the City of Fort Worth community wants. So thank you again for uh, coming and you'll definitely hear from us again soon. We'll be sending out um, links and information that we talked about today. So thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>